Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful, above freezing Sunday morning. Lynette told me as she left her apartment and officially got above freezing, and so it's bound to be a good day. Nice to see all of you here as we gather in worship and praise here at West Alameda Community Baptist Church, the Church of Eaton. It's a, a special week in the life of our church. Lent begins on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. Lent is that 40-day uh, season leading up to Easter, Sundays, so 40 days plus the Sundays that leads up to Easter. And it, uh, in church history, has traditionally been a time when folks who are converting, joining the church, uh, take their last instructions and make their mind up before they officially join. Church has kind of left that behind, but I have decided that uh, for our sermons, for our messages throughout Lent, we're going to cover some of the areas of basic Christianity 101 that uh, those folks would have covered. So we'll have topics like what's the meaning of baptism, what's the meaning of communion, some of those very important things that sometimes we just assume everybody knows. I do invite you to join us uh, here in the center of Lent. 2 o'clock on Wednesday for an Ash Wednesday service. We have a community-wide Ash Wednesday service. We join with our Catholic uh, neighbors here as well and do a brief service at 2 o'clock in position of ashes if you choose. And just a wonderful way to mark the beginning of Lent, that season when we're really called to examine our own lives, our walk with Christ. Uh, many folks uh, traditionally like to give up something for Lent. I've always said I give up liver and onions for Lent. <laughs> Uh, I think it's even more helpful to actually take something out for Lent. So we'll talk about that later on Wednesday as well. To so maybe spend a few extra moments in prayer or Bible study to really uh, spend some time with the Lord during this season. We'll also have available at that service and then next Sunday as well a Lent devotion guide. Uh, it includes a daily uh, suggested Bible reading, uh, some thoughts, some meditations, and some prayer guide. So I uh, encourage you to grab that on Wednesday if you're with us then, or uh, pick your copy up next Sunday as well. An invitation, of course, to join us for Talk Back. We are really enjoying our, um, our series with Max Lucado. I remembered it this week, Patricia. Uh, Max Lucado, uh, you were made for this moment. Uh, story, uh, less, uh, lessons from the Book of Esther really do apply well to us today. And then also an invitation to join us for a Bible study on Thursdays at 3 o'clock. We have a great study going of the Gospel of John. Great discussions. I encourage you to join us for that as well. As we prepare our hearts and minds for our time of worship today, I invite you to hear these words from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained his blessing. The Lord gives us life forevermore. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we gather in this time of worship and praise, we truly pray that our hearts would be centered on you, we pray that our praise would be uplifted and guided by the Spirit, that the words we speak, the prayers that we offer, the songs that we hear and sing would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Rock and our Redeemer.
together in our time of worship, I invite you to remain seated as we sing our call to worship this morning. You'll find the words on the front page of your bulletin or they're on the screen as well. Let's remain seated and sing together the glory of the tree. Glory be to the Father. found on the inserts in your bulletin. The words will be on the screen as well. Let's uh, stand as you wish or remain seated as you wish as we sing together the church's one foundation. And we'll do verses 1, 2, and 5 this morning of the church's one foundation. Some updates and prayer concerns. 
for members of our community and many others. We ask for your uh, prayers for Polly Gowans, who has uh, gone to Western Hills Rehab. We offer prayers for Bill Hale, Jan Kelly, <coughs> Lillian McGuire, Steve McKinney, Shirley Otis, Elizabeth Rojas, and Virginia Welch. We uh, continue, of course, with our prayers for our neighbors in Superior and Louisville. Uh, more stories this week about the struggles many of them are facing to even begin the process of rebuilding their homes, and many of them have no housing at all to, uh, to uh, have for the time that that process will take. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for the improvement in COVID in our community, our city, and our nation, but we recognize that many, many are still struggling with COVID. Uh, many nations and communities are still truly suffering and struggling with that disease, so our prayers continue. We offer prayers this week especially for the people of Ukraine, for the situation, the warfare that is raging in that region. As people of God, we truly, in the midst of warfare, have the temerity to pray for peace. We do that this week as well. For peace in all of our world, that we truly might, as God's children, learn to love and respect one another. We ask prayers on going for Emma Bates with health concerns. For uh, Lisa Hackinson's cousin Steve and his wife June as uh, Steve enters hospice care. Uh, for prayers of thanksgiving for Benita, who uh, Rod mentioned is in a job search, and she was offered a job this week and actually began uh, today, I believe. So uh, we offer our prayers of thanksgiving for Benita's new employment. Uh, we offer ongoing prayers for Rod's sister Marlene, brother-in-law Larry, who did uh, re receive a diagnosis of a, of a torn rotator cuff this week. So. At least he knows what is going on. And then, of course, for Rod's uh, neighbors, Mark and Janice, uh, with health concerns and other concerns as well. Offer ongoing prayers for resident Ronnie Zeiss's son, Jimmy. Uh, we join with Alice Corr in prayers for her friend, Candy. Uh, we offer prayers for Dee Dameron's family, especially for her sister, Linda, who is really struggling with health concerns. Um, we offer ongoing prayers for the uh, daughter of Lillian McGuire, and we offer as well uh, prayers for Bonnie Schaefer's mother, who is uh, struggling with some health concerns. Do we have other joys or concerns to share as we gather in our prayer time this morning? Yes, Dee. Prayers for the people in our building. Prayers for those in our building, certainly. Yes, with joys and concerns that often we don't know or choose not to know. Thank you. Other joys or concerns this morning? If not, I invite you to remain seated. Let's, let's join together in our call to prayer for this morning. Lord, listen to your children praying. You'll find that on the inserts in your bulletin or the words are on the screen as well. Let's remain seated and sing together. Lord, listen to your children praying. silent prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns that have been spoken here this morning, but bring to God as well the unspoken joys and concerns on our hearts. Let's gather together now in a time of silent prayer. A loving and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this day. We thank you, God, for the blessings of warmth and for the blessings of snow and cold, too. We see, God, your marvelous hand as the seasons work their way. We look forward, God, to the coming of spring. And we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that surround us every day, the beauty, the abundance, 
We ask for your forgiveness when we fail, Lord, to give you the thanks and praise that you alone deserve. God, we lift up to you those names we've spoken today and so many names we're not aware of. People struggling with conditions, concerns for their health, facing and recovering from surgery and rehab. Lord, in those times of struggle, struggle with health, we understand. We know often from experience that loneliness is the theme of the day. Loneliness and frustration and pain. And truly, God, we pray that those in those situations might find your presence fleshed out among them. Your love felt within. And truly, God, may you inspire us and open our eyes to love and serve as Christ's hands for those suffering and struggling as well. We ask, God, for your blessings on those caretakers, those men and women who spend their lives offering healing and hope. We pray, Lord, for others whose struggles we don't see, for those facing struggles with illness, and mental illness and addiction and desperation of all kinds. God, again, may your spirit's presence be felt in their lives and may our eyes be open and our hands open as well. We pray, Lord, for the well-being of our community, our city, our state, our nation. We thank you, God, for the progress we're seeing in COVID, and we pray that that continues here at home but around the world as well. We pray, God, for your spirit of wisdom to be poured out, poured out upon those who lead us and seek to lead us in elected office. God, may their motives be pure, and may they always remember their call to those positions, not for glory and power, but to act as your agents for good. We pray, God, for your blessing and protection on all of those men and women who protect and defend and serve us day in and day out, first responders, fire, police, so many others. Lord, like so many blessings in our lives and in our world, we confess we take that for granted. But this day especially, God, we thank you for their service, and we ask that you protect and bless them. And we pray as well for all of the women and men who volunteer their lives and often sacrifice their lives to protect and defend our liberty as a nation, our security. Bring them home, Lord, as their duties end, safely into their loving family's arms. And we pray as well, God, for those who volunteer, who give their lives to sharing the love and the good news of Jesus Christ. Bless their mission, God, and provide for their safety as well. We pray for our world, Lord, for the hunger and famine we see every day on the news that we read about and hear about. As we hear about it, God, we're reminded of your abundance and the blessings that this world contains, and we truly pray for peace and justice that all might thrive, that all might live in security and peace. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. He reminded us that we're your children and ask that we join together in praying this simple prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I uh, often enter this time of offering with themes of God provides for all of us individually, what we need, and for the church as well. But I heard a funny story this week, actually. I'd heard it before, but was reminded of it, of, uh, of a pastor of a medium-sized church with a very active youth group. And it often is the case in churches like that. They turn over one of the Sunday worship services during the year for the youth to run. The youth reads the scripture and shares a message and takes the offering. 
And that's when the trouble began. In particular, there was one junior high boy who had somehow found himself on the group of ushers who was going to pass the plate, and everybody just knew it was going to be trouble. <laughs> and the pastor said, don't worry, it's all good, it'll, it'll be fine. Well, they passed the plate, and of course, people were generous. And in this case, the four boys brought their uh, offerings forward. Well, three of the four boys brought their offerings forward, and the fourth one, the one they were all worried about, was a no-show. <laughs> Slipped out the back door. Should we run after him? The pastor said, no, he didn't. If he needs that money, if his family needs the money, God has provided them with that money. I trust God in this. Well, they didn't like that idea, but, but they went along with it. And they sang their doxology, and they blessed the offering. And about halfway through the sermon, a very contrite young man brought his plate forward down the aisle. He said God had told him, God had told him that people gave that money to bless others, and who was he to take it home? Huh. Wow. A lesson learned, I hope, for him, but a lesson for us too. God gives us so many blessings, and this is truly our chance to think how we can share those blessings, not just our financial gifts, but truly our time, our love, our talents, our prayers. I encourage you to do that as I invite our ushers forward to receive this morning's offering and to bring it forward at the end of the month. stand as you wish as we receive this morning's offering, thanking God for the blessings poured into our lives. transition to the time in our worship service where we open our hearts, our ears, and our mind to hearing God's word. I invite you to remain seated as we sing together our hymn of preparation this morning. You'll find that on the insert in your bulletin again, or the words will be on the screen. Let's remain seated and sing together the gift of love.
Our scripture reading for today comes from the third chapter of Titus, verses 8 to 11. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things, so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. But avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, <coughs> for they are unprofitable and worthless. After a first and second admonition, have nothing more to do with anyone who causes divisions. Since you know that such a person is perverted and sinful, being self-condemned. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Please pray with me. O oh, loving and gracious God, as your word is lifted up, truly open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our lives that we might hear and receive it. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Author Emo Phillips tells the story of a, a strange encounter that he had on one of his usual morning walks. He, he writes, I came across a fellow in some distress as I crossed the old bridge. In fact, there was no doubt he was in distress. He was on the top of the guardrail and looked to be ready to jump over the edge to his sure demise a hundred feet or, slow, or so below. I jumped into action. You know, being a, a Bible-believing Christian and all, it was my duty to help my fellow man. I ran up to him and I said, don't jump, don't do it. The fellow replied, nobody loves me. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't. So I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He replied, well, well yes, I do. So I asked him, are you a Christian? Yes, came the reply, I'm a Christian. Well, I continued, what, what denomination are you? I'm a Baptist, he replied. I'm a Baptist too, I shouted. Are you a Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist, I asked. Northern Baptist came as reply. I'm a Northern Baptist too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist, I asked. Northern Conservative Baptist, he answered. Me too. I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region, I asked him. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region, he answered. Me too, I replied. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Regional Council of 1912, I asked him. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Council of 1912 came his reply, so I called him a heretic and I threw him off the bridge. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know Emo Phillips personally, but the fact that he was recently recognized as one of the greatest Christian humor, humorists of the decade, I, I'm going to assume he was telling a funny fictional story to make a, a very non-fictional point. Christians and the Christian church, unfortunately, just as much as is true for almost any human endeavor or undertaking, have a tendency to figure out amazing ways to divide up and enter into conflict. We love to take sides, even as followers of the one who reminded us in his last hours among us that we should be one. The Apostle Paul joins with Jesus in decrying this fact that we just can't always seem to get that idea through our heads. As Paul continues on in the reading Lynette gave to get that idea through our heads, he struggles. This morning he tells us that we can, clear, we can clearly see times when when we have to draw a line, when we have to say, no, I can't follow you in your error. But so often we squabble and divide over things that just don't rise to any level that really matters, like whether or not you align with the 1879 or the 1912 Regional Council of Northern Conservative Baptists. There are times as followers of Christ we do have to say, I can't go there. I can't follow you in those errors, but there are times we just seem almost anxious to pick a fight. That's why Paul is so critical of these 
false teachers in this letter to Titus regarding those churches on Crete, and really in almost all of his other letters to any church he's ever planted or overseas. Somehow Paul has gotten word about some of the problems that are facing the Christians on Crete as they work to build Christ's church there under the leadership of Titus. Now quite possibly Paul has received a letter from Titus himself. He's responding with advice, answering the questions in that letter. Or, or maybe Paul has heard from some others who had visited the island and reported to Paul some of the challenges that Titus is facing there. The things that Paul is describing here in this morning's scripture reading are issues that are most commonly the marks of false teachers. In particular, the type of false teacher that he's most worried about on Crete are those men who have arisen either from within the church or have come into the church from outside who have come to be called by Paul and others as the Judaizers. Those folks are adamant that the Mosaic law, that Old Testament law, those rules, not just the Ten Commandments, which are eternal laws meant for all of humanity, but, but the 613 laws that in, are in the Old Testament all apply to Christians, even, even the Gentile Christians who really make up the majority of those churches in Crete. In essence, the Judaizers are insisting that to become a Christian, you first have to become an obedient Jew. Circumcision, the dietary laws, the required sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem, honoring the Jewish festivals, all of those extra rules as well that have arisen over the years regarding things like the Sabbath and marriage and even the clothes that you can wear and how your hair is to be cut. The Judaizers have plagued Paul since the beginning of his ministry, they've, they've seeped into many of the churches that he's worked so hard to build. The Jerusalem Council, that's Christianity's head office at the time, has already agreed with Paul that the Mosaic Law is not binding on Christians. But that has not stopped those false teachers' efforts. Actually, the problem kind of still persists in much of the Christian church today under the guise of church-imposed uniform rules and standards on virtually every aspect of life for believers, for members. In some quarters, they count that as holiness, but really all too often it's a little more than legalism, and, and it can drain the joy of your faith faster than anything else ever could. Keith Drury is a retired professor of theology and pastoral care at Indiana Wesleyan University. Really like his writing. Indiana Wesleyan is a university and, and a denomination, frankly, both that have some, something of a reputation for kind of slipping into legalism a bit themselves. But Drury has a, a pretty clear and realistic view of this problem of legalism, this tendency to drain joy and not allow reasonable thinking and disagreements in the church. And he notes with the story how his understanding really goes back to his own childhood. His father, a Wesleyan pastor, but a man who clearly had a clear vision on this topic. One year, Keith, as a junior high school student in his hometown, ended the year on the principal's honor roll. And so he, like all the other honor roll kids, was, was given a family pass for a day at the local amusement park. Keith was so excited, he ran home to share the news, only to be gently told by his father that they couldn't use it. Why? 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 Was all he could respond with. His father patiently explained that the rules of the Wesleyan Church, at least back then, frowned on worldly entertainment like amusement parks. And as the pastor's family, they certainly could not set a bad example. It made as little sense to keep as did the Wesleyan Church's ban on going to the movies. After all, they said, what if Jesus returned and found you in a cinema? Mm -hmm. He swallowed his tears. He pushed down his disappointment, and he prepared for that amusement parkless summer that was ahead. But the next day, it was a Friday, actually, his dad's normal day off from church. His dad woke him up early, told him to get ready for a day trip in the car. Just dad and son. Where are we going, dad? Keith asked. But his dad just told him, get ready, you'll find out. They hopped in the car and they drove over four hours, 200 plus miles, to the outskirts of the closest really big city, Cleveland, Ohio. And then in the distance, Keith saw it, the looming, soaring form of a roller coaster. No, in fact, multiple roller coasters that marked the skyline of the Cedar Point Amusement Park, the 
biggest amusement park in the Midwest, home to the largest assortment of roller coasters anywhere. Really, Dad, really? Keith excitedly shouted. Yeah, his father replied, but don't think you're gonna get me on one of those things. <laughs> he pointed to those roller coasters. They went into the park, they rode a few of the gentler rides together. They ate some of that fun carnival food like corn dogs. And his dad waited patiently while Keith rode several of those big coasters by himself. They didn't leave the park until after sundown. And by the end of that four hour trip home, of course, Keith was soundly sleeping. His father helped him from the car into the house, into his bed. As he was tucking him in, Keith woke up and thanked his dad again for the amazing day. And then he asked the question that kind of might be on your minds too. Dad, it was a good day, wasn't it? There wasn't anything wrong with it, was there? We didn't do anything to disappoint Jesus, did we? And his father replied, yeah, it was a great day. And no, there was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing that would disappoint Jesus at all. Then why, Keith continued, couldn't we just go to the amusement park here in town with the free tickets that I got from school? And his father gave an answer that taught Keith a lesson that he said he carried with him his entire life, including his time as a Wesleyan pastor and as a seminary professor. His dad said, son, there are people in our town and our church who do think it's wrong, that it's a sin to go to an amusement park or a theater. I don't think they're right, but... But the controversy, the trouble that it would stir up for a pastor and his family to be seen doing that just isn't worth it. That's something that really would disappoint Jesus. And he ended with these great words of advice. Sometimes there are more important things in life than winning the argument. I think, in a sense, that's what Paul is saying here when he writes Titus and he tells him to avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. They're unprofitable and worthless. The false teachers, those Judaizers, are, are focusing on those silly games, and, and Paul knows it's best to just not play them. They're stirring up controversies over non-essential things. They're arguing that only a Jew who can trace his lineage back to an appropriate Hebrew tribe has any business acting as a teacher and a leader in a church, and that would probably exclude Titus himself. Then. They're trying to convince people that they have to follow the strictest laws and rules, and even beyond that, those false teachers' interpretations of them. They're, to use a modern phrase, majoring in the minor. And for Paul, that's ridiculous. And beyond that, and totally unacceptable to Paul, they're stirring up dissension in the church. They're causing, or at least attempting to cause, splits in the church. And for Paul, there's almost no bigger sin than that. Talk to them, Paul concludes. Warn them. But as the church's leader, when you see they continue to cause this chaos among the faithful, part of your role as a leader is to invite them, to put it politely, to leave. Paul understands that legalism, those lists of mindless rules that you must follow, supplants grace. And he's adamant that nothing along that line has any place in Christ's church. The church is built on the foundation of grace and freedom that we've been given by God through our faith in Christ. Our faith in Christ reconciles us with God, not the works that we do, not the rules that we follow. You can't do it for yourself, no matter how hard you try, because Christ in his life, death, and resurrection has already done it for you. Grace brings joy. But the legalism, the gains that Paul is warning the types about only bring doubt and despair. We choose to do the right thing in our lives because we want our lives to glorify God through Christ. We're led by the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, guiding us to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves. That summed up the entire law for Jesus, and it should do the same for us. Rules imposed, opinions and beliefs and behaviors dictated by other humans can never replace grace. There was a scientific proof of that of sorts. Good news on that front recently, at least for those of us who look for justification for our hatred of exercising. It came from the University of Colorado, just up the road in Boulder, of all places. Now, common lore says that any moderate exercise is good for you, like it or not. There's studies through a wrench into that. 
And I am not telling you this to give you any excuses. We already have enough of that when it comes to this topic of exercise. All of those pharmaceutical ads say it, and I'll confirm and consult your own doctor before taking your pastor's health advice. <laughs> anyway, these CU researchers, their study looked at whether being forced to exercise has the same health benefits as freely choosing to exercise. And since they logically couldn't actually force human beings to exercise legally anyway, their study focused on lab rats. But we all know from every other study involving lab rats that, that applies directly to us human lab rats. Right? They studied two groups of lab rats. One, one group was allowed to run on those little exercise wheels whenever they liked, whenever and for however long they wanted to. That group of rats showed definite benefits from the exercise. Improved immune systems, fewer illnesses, less heart disease, etc. You know all that stuff your doctor insists applies to us sedentary human beings too? The other group though was forced to run on those wheels. Now don't ask me how, the article didn't say, I don't know if they held tiny little pistols to their tiny little rab, lab rat heads, or, or if they, I don't know, um, forced them on there and refused to give them their rat food dinners until they were finished running. I don't know, it doesn't say, but for the group of lab rats that was forced to exercise, they showed absolutely no health improvements from their exercise regime. I can just picture the scene as all of you go to your next doctor's appointment now. <laughs> well, doc, I was going to start exercising, but now that you told me I have to exercise, the whole idea is pointless. <laughs> Please do not tell them that it was your pastor that gave you that sterling advice. The American Medical Association will be knocking at my door. I'm sure. But you see the parallel I'm making here, I'm sure. When people are forced to follow a certain code of conduct, forced to think a certain way, to act a certain way, they don't benefit. They don't grow. They don't flourish spiritually any more than they do physically. But when people act, when they when they live their lives in a way that reflects being rooted in grace and love, being rooted in Christ, they, they grow in their faith, they grow in their love for God, their love for their neighbor spills over until everyone notices. Keep that in mind. Next time you hear a preacher or a neighbor or a family member telling you you've got all this spiritual stuff all wrong, you've got to do it differently, you've got to do it this way or that way or their way. If you're living in faith, if you're growing in your understanding of God's word, if you're worshiping the one who created you and loves you and redeems you in Christ, if you're allowing yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit, you can just smile and say, oh, thank you for the advice. But my senior doctor, the great physician, God has a totally different idea in store for me. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the grace of for the freedom and liberty you give us in Christ. Truly, God, we understand we can't add one bit to the work that Jesus has done for us. Instead, you call us to respond by loving one another, by loving our neighbors and our world, by showing our love for you. We pray, God, to truly remember that our lives are ordered by grace, not by man. Thank you for that blessing. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And I invite you to remain, uh, remain seated or stand as you wish. As we sing our closing hymn today, you'll find that on the insert in the bulletin. The words will be on the screen as well. Let's uh, sing together. It only takes a spark.
that you might be the spark in someone's life they see God's love truly fleshed out. What a wonderful call that is as we go forth from our time in worship to go forth and be a spark for others. And as you do, I invite you to receive these words of blessing and benediction. Gracious and loving God, we go from this place, our hearts filled with your love and joy. As we go forth, God, may we truly live lives that show your love. Guide our paths, God, and light our footsteps. Give us hearts to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.